right, good morning everyone. Hope you're feeling well. Welcome back to Macroeconomics. And today we're going to switch gears a bit. We've finished talking about macroeconomic growth, which was our last um, big topic. And of course, logically, you may think, well, the next thing to do would be to talk about business cycles. And that is what we're going to do. However, before we get there, it turns out that there's something that we've been sort of assuming all along that we need to discuss in more detail before we can move ahead with our discussion of business cycles. And that is the following. Remember on our first day when we talked about what is macroeconomics, it's the study of economic aggregates. Uh, what's an example of an economic aggregate? We started with GDP. And then if we want to measure GDP, which is total production, we have to somehow find some unit of measure that's common for adding, that we can use to add up all across all the huge variety of final goods and services that we need to count when we're measuring production. And what was the unit that we used? Well, we measured them using market prices, and if we're measuring something using market prices, what is our unit of measure? Dollars. Well, if we're trying to add up GDP for Korea, it would be one. And if we're trying to add up GDP for, I don't know, Iran, it would be reals. The point is that it's money that we're using as our unit of measure. Also, and this is always there in, in, this has actually been there latent since you started microeconomics. When we do demand and supply, what are we doing? We're determining the quantity of something produced, which is a real number, but we're also determining the price, which is measured in money. Like what we're looking at in economics, because that's how much of the world works, is an economy where people produce stuff in exchange for money. It's not true that you can't have trade without money, right? I could, um, um, I don't know, give this econ lecture and you guys all give me bottles of tea in exchange, right? And then no money changes hands. And that's fine. That's called barter. So money is not necessary for trade. But the fact is, it's, the stand, it's a standard way in which trade is conducted. And that means that it will be useful for us to understand how it is that the monetary system works. And in fact, its proper functioning is going to be essential to having a properly functioning economy. So we'll have to think about what issues are, are there in the economics of money. So that's one thing that we need to talk about. A second thing that we need to talk about that's kind of been there all along, it, although again, I guess it came up mainly on Monday, is the following. Remember that on Monday we were discussing how the various institutions that are sort of required for the economy to be productive, and if they're not there or they're not functioning properly, then the economy is producing at a much lower level because effort and resources aren't being rewarded, aren't productive. On that list of things that need to be in place for the economy to function properly was this thing called financial development. And that came up because, I guess in a nutshell, for the economy to function well, you need um, 
money to be moving towards its most productive use, right? Its more productive use might be the generation of a new idea. Its more pro most productive use might be the maintenance of a pre-existing factory or business. But either way, the money may not have, there may be wealth that's allocated to people who don't necessarily have the most productive use for that wealth. And then the financial system, which relies on financial development, is there to channel the funds where they are most productive. And a key part of that, of course, as we discussed, well, that whole system that moves the funds around, we call the financial system. But if you and I interact with the financial system, most likely, the entity that we're going to interact with is a bank. Also, having established that money is sort of essential to how the economy works these days, where is most of your money? When you bought breakfast this morning, if you did, what did you pay with? G World or something, right? Did that you didn't actually give them an object. Your funds in some account, bank account somewhere went from your account to I don't know, GW Delhi's account or whoever it was. So money is essential. Banking is essential or financial, the financial system more broadly. And the two are inextricably tied. Can't separate them. So. What we want to do today, is, and I guess next week as well, is to go through the same process we went through at the beginning of the semester of, well, opening a certain area, defining what it is that we're talking about, talking about how we're going to measure the thing that we're talking about, and then trying to use economics to understand how that thing behaves in this case, the payment system and the financial system. Okay? So that's the plan. Now, in most universities, there actually is a course called Money and Banking, which is why I wrote this, where um, you spend an entire semester thinking only about what we're going to spend a, a couple of weeks thinking about. And I actually teach that course here, except that if you're interested in this subject, interested in this subject, at GW, this course, which is Econ 2121, is referred to as financial economics. I forget why we changed the name. It used to be called money and banking. But it's the same thing. This is what it's about. It's understanding the payment system and the financial system. So before jumping into this um, formally, I always find it useful to spend a little time literally looking at some money to think about, because in so doing, certain themes that will, be, will keep us busy for the next couple of weeks will, or at least should, pop out quickly. Here are some examples of money. There. So what I'm showing you, what I'm displaying here are some examples of coins from around the world. Um, <clears throat> and OK, they're coins. That's fine. They're easily recognizable as such. But several things should leap out. First of all, they're different, right? Not only are they different, they're connected to some. Unfortunately, the copy didn't come out very well, but the one up top here, it says clearly Mozambique. And this is, I think, Japanese. Is that right? And. Somehow, different states use different coins, or different money, more broadly. That's interesting. It suggests lots of things. First of all, 
there is no one thing that has to be money. In fact, we know that even here we use several things, different things as money. We use coins, we use paper bills, and we use bank deposits. So money isn't any specific thing. What determines money? It's just what we use as money. So money is just determined by whatever it is that we use as money. And apparently, for some reason, what we use as money varies by place. So somehow, or I guess maybe more precisely, varies by government. So what is used as money somehow seems to be connected to who's in government in a particular area. What else do we see? We see that these things have different shapes. Well, most of them are round. Um, but you know, this thing has a hole in it. This thing has squiggly edges. And this one is square. And given how that we've established that having a properly functioning monetary system is important, there must be reasons for those things. <clears throat> Although again, there's also variety suggesting that there's no, there must be some um, deep logic behind all of these things that's again not connected to what the thing actually is made of necessarily. And so, um, we'll have to think about that. At the same time, there are some commonalities, right? If you, what's the money here? The money here is coins, paper, and deposits. What's the money in Mozambique? Coin, paper, and deposits, even if they're using a different currency. So again, there must be something that means that we've converged to those forms of money as opposed to using other things. If you go back in history, were there other things that were used as money? Sure. There were things like precious metals. Um, in some areas and times, other things were used as money, such as salt or rice. In some ports, I believe pepper was used as currency at some point. And those things aren't in use now, but again, there must be some logic that leads certain things to be used as money and not others. And some things to be used as money in one place and not another. So we're going to want to understand what, why do certain things end up being used as money and not others? Why is money used in some places and not others? And again, if governments Clearly, governments want to control what is used as money in any particular place. Are there countries that, where the official currency is not something from the country itself? Yeah. For example, Ecuador uses the dollar as its official currency. And El Salvador uses crypto as a currency lately. But in general, that's the exception, not the rule. So somehow, having a government's control over its currency is very valuable for that government. Um, one last point before we move on. Notice the square coin. It came out dark, unfortunately. Um, but it has the number one. It's square. And it says British Malaya. Okay. Is British Malaya a thing? Not anymore. But, who ran British Malaya? The Brits. The Brits ran British Malaya. And this coin was not made there. The Brits made it and shipped it over. Again, control of the currency must be very valuable if they did that. Why is the thing square? 
Well, suppose that you are the Brits and you're making currency for your colony, which you want to keep really tight control over. You don't want them to have, if they control their currency, then you know, it makes it easier for them to control their affairs and maybe break away. Um, you need to ship it over there. And last I checked, the UK is really far from former British Malaya. So suppose you made circular coins and you pack them onto your ship. What do you have in between lots of circular coins packed into a big crate? You have lots of empty space. What do you have in between a bunch of square coins packed together? No empty space. So again, this emphasizes a number of things. The value of keeping control of a, for a government of keeping control of the whatever it is that's used as money in a particular place. And the fact that these shapes aren't accidents. Like what it is that we use as money and what form it takes is not an accident. It must be derived from deeper properties. In this case, in the case of the square coin, it's well, making it easier to transport. Why does this thing have a hole in it? Okay, sorry? Yeah, so nowadays, this is a five yen coin, I think, and nowadays in Japan, no one carries around their coins on a string, but ancient East Asian coinage also had holes, and yeah, it means that you can run a string through it and carry it around easily. So also ease of transportation, right? So again, many things are used as money. What's used as money and, and or the form it takes is not an accident. It must be due to sort of some deeper properties. Um, we don't use water as money. We don't use elephants as money. And again, for some reason, having govern, governmental control of money seems to be very valuable. Yeah? The squiggly shape. Um, they fit together easily. Countries with squiggly shaped currencies, um, I haven't looked into this, but I think countries with squiggly shaped currencies tend to be British colonies, like Hong Kong, so South Africa, I think. South Africa. So this, that's from Swaziland. Um, or oh, sorry, Eswatini. So my guess is it's also these things at least originally were made elsewhere, and well, they fit nicely together in, in a crate. So as mentioned, of course, coins aren't the only form of money we use nowadays. Here's a Benjamin. <clears throat> we also use paper money. And well, let's say this is a hundred dollar bill. And suppose, let's see. I like your phone. I'm going to offer you $100 for it. Let's say you paid $50 for it. Would you accept it? Yeah. OK. That was a hundred. This is ten billion. Now I'm offering you this instead. Would you take it? <laughs> right. The answer is different. Um, the number is meaningless, right? On its own, this number doesn't mean anything. And nor does this number. Neither of those numbers really mean anything without further information. What makes you accept the hundred in this example, but not this thing? Um, this is a larger number. So what gives money its value? Well, if this were, if I were offering you a lump of gold, a few hundred years ago, then of course you know what it is. It's a lump of gold, and if you can weigh it, you can figure out 
what I'm actually giving you. But these numbers don't mean anything. They're just stamped on it. And then the real value, as in the value in terms of goods and services that come out of it, what does that depend on? On what, sorry? On the value of the currency, but what determines that? I mean, sorry? Our belief. Yeah, our belief, right? Because why do you accept $100? Do you eat $100? Do you wear $100? No. You then use it later to buy something from someone else. And how much are you going to... So what you're willing to give up for this $100 bill, or not, depends on what you think you can get, beliefs, from the next person you're going to trade with. So none of that is, um, and again, num that has nothing to do with the number that's on it. So we're going to need to figure out what kinds of things are used as money, why those things are used as money and not other things. Um, clearly what's used as money depends on context, because some things are used as money in some places and others. And as we just discussed, some things are used as money at different time periods in the same place. And finally, we'll have to figure out what ultimately determines the value. Well, there's some kinds of money where, again, what I'm giving you is an actual object that you can use. But clearly, that's not the case nowadays. So we want to figure out how this kind of money, which just has a number on it, ends up being valued. Okay, so let's do that. So as I said, when we introduce a new topic, we always start with definitions and then go to measurements. So the first thing we want to define, obviously, is money. So what's money? We observe that we can define money as anything in particular. It's not gold, it's not silver, it's not paper, it's not bank deposits. Money is defined as what? It's whatever we accept in exchange whenever we transact. So we can call this either a widely accepted means of exchange, because again, we could always barter. We don't, usually. I've also seen it defined as the means of payment. It should be obvious that if you're paying for something, it means some exchange took place. I gave you the payment, and you gave me a good or service voluntarily. So that's the first thing. And as discussed, there are, in a sense, two different kinds of money. One kind of money was where I actually give you a thing. I give you a lump of gold or, or some, a, a weight of salt or a weight of rice or whatever it is. So money where what I'm giving you has value because of what it is, and so its value is connected to, let's say, how many grams of gold I'm giving you, or whatever it is. It's called commodity money. Actually, on that note, it's interesting to see that many currencies these days are named after units of weight. What's the currency in the UK? The pound. What's the currency in Argentina? The peso. Peso means weight. What's the currency in Israel? It's the shekel, which is an ancient unit of weight. I think it comes from Assyrian or something. Um, what's the dollar? It's also an ancient unit of weight for metals. Maybe not so ancient. Medieval, maybe. And so on. So many currencies actually are named after units of weight. So. 
at some point there were commodity, there was probably commodity money in all these places and then they moved on but they kept the name for the currency. So clearly we don't use commodity money now. So we need a name for the kind of money we use now which is money where its value is not connected to what it's made of. Okay? And that is, that name is fiat money. So, got to be careful about the terminology here. Fiat means decree or command, right? So it sounds like fiat money is money that is there because someone ordered it to be money. And it is true that probably governments have some say in what is or isn't used as money, although, as discussed, ultimately it depends on our behavior. The government can decree that something is money and we can ignore it. Um, but fiat money in this context, again, just means as opposed to commodity money. Its value is not connected to what it's made of. Right, the $100 bill I showed you is not worth $100 because that's how much paper there is in there. And the bank deposit that you used to buy your breakfast this morning at GW Delhi has no physical existence. Right? So it's, except as ones and zeros on the computer. So it's fiat money. I guess on that note of saying the government can't tell you what is money, um, there is one thing that you can do with US dollars that you can't do with anything else. So in that sense, the government has some power over what you use as money to some extent. What is the one thing you can only do with US dollars? Yeah. Um, you can make... Swiss franc deposits at the bank. So something uh, that you can only do with US dollars every April. Pay taxes. Right. So the government can say, they can't say, they can't force you to, I mean, if the GW Delhi wants to accept Swiss francs from you, nothing can stop them, right? Although they might not want to, that's a separate matter, right? They could if they wanted to. But the government can say, you can only pay taxes in US dollars, and they do, unless you're a farmer. If you're a farmer, you can give them some sort of produce, but otherwise you have to pay in US dollars. So the government has some, and of course that is going to affect what you pay with taxes, because if everyone needs to pay taxes in dollars, then well, this is, it's not commodity money, but it is something that underpins its value, right? But. There are contexts where the government decrees things about money and fails. So, for example, I can give you two examples. One is when I was, long ago, when I was a graduate student, I went to Laos. And in Laos, the currency is the kip. Um, but um, I remember going past a store there and they had a whiteboard outside with their prices for certain goods, the, the ones that they sold most often. And these prices were in KIP, which is the local currency, but they were also in BAT, which is the Thai currency. And they were also in Euros, and they are also in Dollars. So clearly, you know, the government of Laos says you guys need to use KIP, but this store is using four different currencies. And why are they doing that? Well, would you accept BAT from me? Probably not. But they are. Why? Because, yeah. Because it's what? Well, again, um, he's not accepting BAT from me, regardless of the value. I mean, yeah. Because they can use it. Yeah, exactly. There are Thai people around. Actually, this is in Long Pavang, it's next to the border, but still. And why Euros? Because there are a bunch of German tourists. And why dollars? Because they're a bunch of American tourists. So it's not hard to find someone who will accept them. Unlike here, in this room, 
if I try to buy something from you in Thai currency. So, again, the government of Laos decreed that the kip is the currency, but the store is doing its own thing. Because it can. Any questions, thoughts, uh, comments about commodity and fiat money? Right. So the next logical question is to say, OK, so as discussed, we start with definitions, and then we move to measurement. So if we want to measure how much money there is, then we need to ask the question, OK, then what is it exactly that we use as money nowadays? So what is it exactly that we use as money nowadays? There are two broad bins, right? One is the Benjamins, the currency, the, the bills. There's also the coins because, um, well, if you look at a money and banking textbook, they'll sometimes write coins separately, but that's because there's this quirk in the United States. The Fed issues the paper money and the Treasury issues the coins. So they're separate, but let's just throw coins into currency because that's the way we usually use the word. And the other thing we use as money, as discussed, is certain kinds of accounts. So not all accounts are literally usable as money. If you had a savings account, you can't pay with that, right? But let's just call the accounts that you can use to make payments checking accounts. You can write checks on them. You can pay with them. Pay. You can use them to buy stuff by swiping a debit card. That is just a device that um, moves money from your account to the account of the seller. You can go to the bank and withdraw money from your checking account and then use it as cash. Either way, <clears throat> accounts that you can use to make payments, we're going to call checking accounts. And if you added up all the currency out there and all the funds in the checking accounts, you would end up with something called M1. Okay? Now, the fact that I spelled this out, this is literally what we use as money, and then I named it M1, is a hint that somehow this isn't fully satisfactory. What's the problem? Um, the problem is savings accounts. Are savings accounts money? No. Can't pay with them. But one thing you can do is, suppose you had a savings account and a checking account. One thing you could do is whip out your phone, press a few buttons, and the money is moved from your savings to checking. Press a few more buttons, and you just bought something from Amazon. Right? So it's not literally money, but it's kind of almost money. And that does two things. First, it means that when economists are trying to figure out how much money there is out there, they don't necessarily look at M1. They'll have a broader definition that includes what's in M1 plus some other things that aren't money but are extremely easy to turn into money, which means savings accounts, and some other accounts that are very easy to turn into money, which sometimes they're called time deposits, sometimes they're called certificates of deposit or CDs. And what are these? These are accounts that you open with a bank and you say, 
Um, I promise not to take the funds out for the next six months. The bank is happy because they know they can play with your money for six months without having to worry about you taking it out. They reward you with interest. And so we're also going to include certificates of deposit up to six months. And yes, there is M3. What does M3 include? Well, CDs longer than six months. And something else called money market accounts, which you don't need to worry about. <clears throat> so, so, the existence of things that are very easy to turn into money means that we have these two definitions, M1 and M2, where some things in M2 aren't literally money, but are super easy to turn into it. And perhaps most importantly, what this suggests is that being money is not a yes-no thing. There is money, and there are things that are almost money, and things that are not quite money, but not too far off either, and so on. This is a spectrum. And that concept, which is how close to being money is this thing, has an important name, which is liquidity. So I'm going to define liquidity, liquidity as the ease of turning a thing into money. So far we are, so what's going on here is that money is the most liquid thing by definition because it is money, but there are some things that are extremely liquid, such as savings accounts, that maybe we want to include in our definition of money for practical purposes. And it also means that this concept of liquidity is something that we could extend to anything, actually. You could talk about the ease. It's often used to refer to the ease with which you can sell something. But of course, what is selling something? You're turning it into money. So it's the same thing. But this means that you can talk about, again, the liquidity of anything. The liquidity of a chair, the liquidity of a board. You know, everything, the, the board is not very liquid, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a liquidity. It's just that it's very low. So thinking about what money is literally in this day and age is useful because it introduces this broader concept of liquidity. What can we do next? The next thing we can do is to notice that given that money, by definition, is a widely used means of exchange, <clears throat> that means that it may end up playing certain additional roles in the economy. So once you have something that's a widely accepted means of exchange, you may end up finding that it's useful for doing a bunch of other things, which will underlie, underline how important it is to have a system of money, to have a standardized means of exchange. Remember, how did I start this class by saying that all along, even though we weren't discussing it in detail, money has been sort of there in the background. I said, look, we started off with our first aggregate and we measured GDP using prices, which means that we're using money as the unit. So once you have a standard means of exchange, it makes sense to use money precisely as a unit of account. We don't count how many pigs we have and how many apples we produced and you know, how many computers we made and so on. We, that we measure them in dollars if we're in the United States. We measure them in units of money. 
So this also becomes a standard unit of account, which of course enables accounting. Comparisons of value, which would be difficult to make without having a standard. So that's an additional societal function that having a standard means of exchange provides. In addition, there's another thing that money might enable you to do, although it may not be the only way of doing it. And that's the following. Suppose I bought your phone from you for $100. What do you do with $100? Do you, well, there's a choice, actually. You could do one of two things with $100. You could run off to GW Daily and buy something, or not. And if you don't, it's not because you're going to throw the $100 away. It's because you're buying something later. In other words, whatever you well, having some sort of system of money makes money one of the possibly various ways in which you could store value over time. Not the only one, because you could have a lump of gold in your in your house, right? There are other ways of storing value. Your house itself is actually a store of value because you can sell it later and recover some funds from it. But the point is that if you have a system of money, one of the roles that it would naturally play would be as a store of value. And that dovetails into a discussion of, well, given that money naturally would end up playing all of these functions, that's going to place some limits on the kinds of things that would or would not work well as money. If money is something that we probably need to have as a good, well, if one of the things that money does is function as a store of value, then probably money shouldn't be something that breaks easily. In other words, money should probably be something that's durable. Are precious metals durable? Check. Salt and rice? Fairly. Uh, paper money? Well, actually, the paper money isn't literally paper. It has all sorts of plastic and other things in it to make sure that it is durable. And what about bank deposits? Well, they're as durable as the bank is um, properly keeping track of what's in your deposits, which suggests that the banking sector probably has a lot of regulation. if they are so central to the payment system, which is indeed the case. Banks are extremely heavily regulated compared to any other firm. <clears throat> so that's one issue. That's one property that um, money should have, which limits what kinds of things can or cannot be money. Like meat probably isn't going to be money, because it goes bad in a few days. <clears throat> Slim Jim, what other properties might be necessary for something to function well as money? Well, let's think of um, something that's highly durable, that functioned sort of as money. Have you ever been to the Natural History Museum here? No? Well, you should check it out sometime, but if you walk in the back door, 
One of the first things you see is a gigantic stone wheel. Anyone remember it? The giant stone wheels of Yap. So the giant stone wheels of Yap are a form of currency. And it's a form of currency because, um, well, at least when these things were used, I guess they're still used every now and then, they weren't used very much. They were used for like big things. Not transactions between individuals, but transactions between like villages. And like if my village did your village a huge favor, then you would pay me by bringing over a gigantic stone wheel. And what does it do? It's a physical symbol that, well, next time I need a favor, I'll pay you with this wheel and, and so on. So it's sort of a form of money which is convenient for large things, in this case favors among, I guess, states, almost. But the gigantic stone wheels of Yap, which are sitting in the museum, would not be very useful for buying green tea. So in our context, that certainly wouldn't work. So if we're going to have an economy where there's a regular means of exchange for everyday objects, whatever we use as money has to be divisible. Are precious metals divisible? Sure, because you can make coins in different sizes with different weights. Again, many currencies' names are names of units of measure of weights, and it's no coincidence. Salt and rice, certainly divisible because you just pour out whatever weight of that item you want to pay. Um, what about our fiat money today? Yeah, you just need to write different numbers on different objects. As long as the numbers are small enough, good, as long as the range is wide enough, we don't have divisibility problems. And of course, bank deposits are perfectly divisible. What else? Another thing about money is that, of course, if I offer you a piece of money, you must be able to see that it is what I said it was, as opposed to what? As opposed to me giving you something, telling you it's money, and it isn't. So let's call that ease of recognition. So here's an example for why that might be important in determining what is or isn't used as money. As you all know, gold was once used as money, gold coins rather, and one property of gold is that if it's less than, I think, 91% pure or something like that, it doesn't shine. What does that mean? It means it's really easy to tell a real gold coin from a fake one, because a fake one doesn't shine. Or a gold coin that's highly impure, because right? half gold, half something else, it kind of looks like gold, but it doesn't shine. Uh-uh, this is fake. You're not actually giving me gold. So that's a nice example for illustrating the idea of ease of recognition being important, and it also underlines why gold is so special as something that different societies might converge on as a, an object that you use as money. In our day and age, how does ease of recognition matter? Well, those, those $100 bills that I was showing you, they have all sorts of security features. Like you hold them up to the light and you're supposed to see a watermark and if it's not there, then it's fake. And there's a special um, flashlight that you shine on it, and if a certain part of it doesn't glow, then it's fake. So there are all sorts of security measures there to make sure that fake money doesn't enter the system. Because if it did, that would be a huge problem. Um,
Let me see how much time we have. 1225, right? It would be a huge problem because <clears throat> it would entirely undermine the, the monetary system. So if you know that there's good money and bad money out there, right? let's imagine it with the case of gold. There are pure coins and impure coins, and you can't tell the difference. If someone is offering you a, a coin, what should you assume? If it were a good one, they'd be holding on to it. So it must be a bad one. So if this issue comes up that you're you can't recognize the money, you can't tell fakes from real ones, what it can do is destroy the value of the money altogether. Yes? So, like, is there, if there is a lot of, like, bad money going into our fund, but there's not, like, like does that cause inflation in the same way that putting, like, more good money into the economy would cause I mean, it would cause inflation in the sense that, um, I guess, that money is now worth very little, so you would only be able to get very few goods with it, which is the same thing as saying the price is rose, right? So, so it, would it could cause inflation, but it could be worse. It could cause people not, not to use the money anymore. And as explained, it's, <laughs> the use of money is pretty critical to having the economy work properly. Actually, we'll get back to, to that in a second. Um, actually, what I just said is something known as Gresham's Law. <clears throat> Final, although it's not fair because people have known about it for thousands of years, but Gresham got the name. Last, going back to the giant stone wheels of Yap, those things are pretty inconvenient to carry around. So, money has to be something that's easy to carry around because, you know, you never know where you, when you're going to need something. Um, I guess that pops out of the discussion we had earlier about why do coins in East Asia have holes in them, why were the British Malayan coins square. That has to do with portability, the ease of moving the thing around. Are coins easy to carry? Yeah, as long, I mean, the coinage that we use nowadays is not made of gold, it's made of something light. Some copper nickel alloy. Um, is paper money portable? Very easy to move around. I mean, this is a big plus of fiat money. You can transport large amounts of funds um, very easily. Um, is it easy to move deposits around? Extremely easy, right? You just need to carry around your debit card. Swipe it somewhere and the funds go where they need to go. So, again, all of these, given that money plays these functions, it means that the things we use as money would need to satisfy these properties, which of course um, they do. Any questions or thoughts about either the roles that money plays or the properties that therefore it must have? Yeah. What do you mean by safety? Like the ease with which I can take it away from you? Mm -hmm. I, guess it, I guess it could, although I'm not sure how, I mean that's always gonna be a problem, right? I'm not sure how, like what things would be easier to take away from you than other things? I'm not quite sure how we would. Yeah, I guess, so, safety, I don't see safety as being an issue with physical objects in the sense that whatever it is that uses money, someone could just steal it, right? So it's not clear to me that it distinguishes what is or isn't used as money. When it comes to fiat money, I guess the fiat money system really needs a security system, especially to the extent that we depend on deposits, on accounts. Yeah, you really need to make sure that the banks are not hackable, and things like this, because otherwise it would it would fail, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So last, I think what it would be useful to do is to think a bit about 
why it is that we use money so widely. So as we were discussing, it is not true that money is necessary for trade. Right? I could suppose um, I liked your phone and I wanted to buy it and I didn't have money. I could still trade with you if I have something else of value to offer. Right? It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be a widely accepted means of exchange. There could be barter instead. So the question is, why is money so widely accepted, given that, in principle, it's not necessary for trade? So to do that, to think about that, let's think of an example. Let's set up a world where there are people who want to trade. Now, if there are people trading, there must be, each person must be characterized by two things. First of all, there must be something that they want. That thing that they want must also be something they don't make. Second, there must be something that they do make. So, let's say, in this world, we insert Professor Samaniego. And Professor Samaniego has a particular want, which is green tea. Evidently. In large quantities. Good for you. But I don't produce green tea. What do I produce instead? I produce, I guess, econ classes. And then, we, into this world, we need to introduce another person. Let's say, GW Delhi. And GW Delhi guy has tea, among other things. So, I go over to GW Delhi and I say, hi. I would like some tea, please. And GW Delhi guy says, sure. But what do you have to offer me? And I say, well, I can give you an econ lecture. And he says, I don't care about econ. I'm not going to give you your tea. OK, if he liked econ and wanted to hear my lectures, we could barter, right? I'd give him an econ lecture, and he'd give me the tea. So we could barter. But it would require what's called a double coincidence of wants. In other words, I have to want what he has, and he has to want what I have. And if you pick two random people, the chance of a double coincidence of wants is probably pretty low. And indeed, the GW Delhi guy is not interested in econ lectures. What is he interested in? Hmm? Sorry? Well, remember, money is not a thing that you eat, right? Money is just a means of uh, getting other things. So I haven't been to the GW Delhi in a while, so I'm not incriminating anyone by saying this, since whoever worked there probably doesn't anymore. But when I used to go there, the GW Delhi guy was very interested in gambling services. What? Yeah, I used to go to Vegas every year. And he used to do sports betting. So again, that person is probably long gone. So I'm not incriminating anyone. Anyway, the point is they want something that's not econ lectures. And then out here, there's a third person. Who is, um, someone wants to call him Henry, fine. Who has gambling services to provide. We don't know what Henry wants, but 
unless it's T, again, no transaction here. Now into this world, let's insert some green pieces of paper. Suppose I have this green piece of paper. Maybe it has numbers on it. And we're going to call it money. And now I come up to the GW Delhi guy and I say, I would like some tea. Nice. He says, um, what do you have for me in exchange? And I say, I have econ lectures. He says, uh -uh. do you have anything else? Well, I have these green pieces of paper. He might accept this green piece of paper in exchange for tea. Why might he believe that? Why am I sorry? Why might he accept this thing, which isn't something that he wants, right? It's fiat money. It's useless. He would accept it if he believes that when he goes to, the, to Henry, who provides gambling services, Henry is going to accept the green piece of paper. And then why would Henry accept the green piece of paper? Because he believes the next person in this chain is also going to accept the green piece of paper. So, you can have this situation where an object that no one wants, fiat money, is still circulating as a means of payment because given that it's widely accepted, it makes sense to accept it. It's rational. And notice also, this is actually creating value for society. Because if the money were not circulating in this fashion, you would be limited to barter. And barter can only happen in certain very limited situations where there's a double coincidence of wants. <clears throat> and in addition, suppose there were no money, and so you relied on double coincidences of wants for trade. What would you do in that world? Since you wouldn't be able to obtain a lot of the things that you might want, bless you, you would have to be more self-sufficient. So, in other words, having a monetary system enables us to specialize, getting really good at certain things. Why? Because getting really good at certain things, and let's say whether it's specializing in econ lectures or specializing in providing gambling services or whatever it is, you can do that because you're not going to miss out on anything because you can easily buy whatever it is that you need or want thanks to the money. And conversely, if something were to happen to the money, that means the monetary system starts to fail and for some reason we no longer accept money in exchange, it would cause serious problems to our ability to obtain real goods and services. I don't have it here, but I used to have a coin from Somalia which said FAO on it. In other words, the coin was issued by the UN agency, the Food and Agriculture Organization. So Somalia has had a sort of ill-functioning government for decades now. And some of the things that the governments usually provide are provided by the United Nations. And they felt that one of the things, at least at the time, one of the things that was critical to get the place running was to make sure there was some currency for people to use and trade and specialize and so on. All right. Any questions, comments, thoughts about all this? So let me see how we're doing for time. We have about 10 minutes. And you all know what that means. So today we spent most of our time talking about money. Logically, next week we're going to talk about banking. In the meantime, let's do a quick exit quiz to check how we're doing with today's stuff. So please head on over to this particular game pin and when we've hit a decent number of people, I'll just start. <coughs> Someone here is a big fan of ice cream.
Let's see, I'll start when we get about a hun around 100. <clears throat> I'm sorry about Jalen. All right. I'm going to say that everyone who wanted to come in is in when we get a hundred. All right, let's get going. First question. Money can be defined as what? Is it an object everyone needs? A widely accepted means of payment? Something with no intrinsic value? Or an object that's available in a fixed quantity? <coughs> Very good. Most of you got that right. And Harry was fast on the draw. Next, which of the following is an example of fiat money? Gold coins, salt, silver coins, or bank deposits? Running out of time. The answer, of course, is bank deposits. Aisukurimu is doing well. Does, is M1 less than or equal to M2? Always, never, sometimes, or they are always And the answer, of course, is it's always less because M2 includes M1. Paper money these days is valuable because of what? It is a means of exchange, it's backed by gold, it's made of paper, or it is a unit of account. It's fiat money, it's valued because it is a means of exchange. Next, last. The ease with which something can be turned into money is what? It's taking so long, and the answer, of course, is liquidity. So, let's see who won. Whoever won, please come up. I have a little something for you. Everyone else, thank you. Hope to talk to you soon. The winner is Blake. Good job, everyone. So, you know how to find me if you want to talk. Have a good one.